Hey, welcome to Return of the King. This is our series where we're going chapter by chapter through the book of Revelation to see what the Bible really has to say about the last days. And today is going to be an exciting episode as we're looking at one of the most famous chapters in probably the entire Bible, Revelation chapter 13. Even people who don't have any kind of church background or religious background probably are familiar with the contents of Revelation 13, and that's the beast and the mark of the beast, that famous 666. So all throughout popular culture, uh, there are references to this. And so today we're going to take a, a dive into Revelation 13 to figure out what these really are. And I hope that you'll uh, really interact with this and let me know your thoughts and insights uh, as we go through. So uh, let's dig in. Uh, now, as we do, we need to understand where Re uh, Revelation 13 kind of fits in the big uh, scheme of things. This is actually right in the middle of a point in the book of Revelation where the action sort of pauses for a moment to give us a big picture perspective. And so Revelation 12 through 14 sort of zooms out uh, to really help us to see kind of the, the uh, really the context that all of Revelation and the, the, the events of the last days are falling into. So Revelation chapter 12, uh, in our last video, we talked a little bit more about this. This is really helping us to see that this conflict that we're seeing uh, is really a very, very ancient conflict, uh, that this is not something that's new and sudden and unexpected, that this has been going on really since the very beginning. Uh, and then in Revelation 13, we come to the climax, <clears throat> excuse me, of the conflict. Uh, that this is where uh, we see the Antichrist rising um, and the, the big conflict between uh, the beast and the people of God. And then Revelation uh, chapter 14 gives us sort of that quick snapshot of the conquest of the land. Uh, we see how everything is going to culminate in the end. Uh, so let's dive into Revelation chapter 13 and see what the scripture uh, has to say. So we're going to catch the first several verses and then we'll unpack that uh, before we move on. Revelation 13, starting in verse 1, again, I'm reading uh, from the English Standard Version. You can follow along in your translation. In fact, I'd encourage you to have uh, a tab open with the Bible or have your Bible open near this so that you can kind of reference some of the things that we'll be talking about. Starting in verse 1, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its head. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth, and to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. So remember the way that chapter 12 wrapped up is that the dragon has been cast down out of heaven. It's lost that, uh, that war with Michael and his angels. He's been cast down to earth. He makes war on the woman and on the woman's child, uh, the people of God, essentially. And then we, we see Revelation chapter 12 ending with the dragon standing on the seashore. And this is what we see uh, emerging now from the sea, almost as though the dragon is beckoning, calling this beast up out of the sea. So continuing on with verse three, one of his heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast and they worshiped the dragon for he had given his authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell on earth. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he will go. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword, he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. So we'll pause here and try to unpack this a little bit and catch the big picture of Revelation 13 before we really move on. And again, as we go throughout, if you have any 
questions or comments, I hope you'll leave those uh, in the comments section below. Uh, certainly, if you have any real um, uh, uh, earnest questions, I'll try to answer those. Uh, but if you want to leave your thoughts, uh, be interested to, to see what you have uh, as we go. And remember, if you find anything that's uh, helpful in this, you give you something new to think about, some new insight along the way, I hope you'll like it. And if you want to follow uh, the series, uh, I hope you'll subscribe and hit that notification. We're right at that halfway point of Revelation. We've already got over 20 videos in the series, uh, but we'll hope that you'll uh, follow as we go along. So let's jump in. So here's that big picture of Revelation 13. Again, uh, since uh, Satan has lost that war in heaven, he's pictured as that red dragon in Revelation chapter 12. And since he's lost that war in chapter 12, Satan's wrath is turned fully toward humanity on earth, particularly God's people, Christ followers, uh, as we'll see. Uh, there's actually two beasts that are mentioned in Revelation 13. Most people tend to focus on the, the first beast. That's the one that is most familiar. But the second beast is also important, and we'll learn more about him as we go along. The first one comes from the sea. And as we'll see that uh, this is the Antichrist, he forms this one world government. So he seems to be the political ruler uh, throughout the world. The second one comes from the land, uh, and this is the Antichrist prophet, and he forms a one world religion. So we kind of see this with the current Pope having these interfaith dialogues uh, in this particular photo uh, with the Muslims. Uh, but what we'll see is some kind of world, one world religion that kind of forms during this time. And this is kind of a compulsory religion. Um, the, th the third big thing is that we're going to see the dragon and the two beasts form this unholy counterfeit trinity. They're not truly a trinity in the way that God is, but this is sort of that imitation. Uh, one per, uh, person of this trinity is uh, the angelic being, uh, Satan, and then the two satanically empowered humans. These are those two beasts uh, that we see. So they uh, form this triumvirate, this uh, this trinity in the loosest sense of the word, uh, to, to really exert this rule and control over planet Earth and over humanity. Uh, the fourth thing is that we also see that just as God's people are sealed in Revelation 7, the beast has a counterfeit seal, and that's known as the mark of the beast. This is really the more uh, popularly known marks, if you will, in the book of Revelation, but the more important one is the sealing in Revelation 7. Uh, this one, though, is uh, what we'll see in chapter 13, is the counterfeit seal. God has the original, the authentic, and the beast and that unholy trinity try to imitate uh, and, and impersonate God and all that he does. So that kind of raises the question, who or what is the beast? Uh, kind of the big question there. Uh, so verses one and two have these descriptors. And we're not going to get into all the details, but we'll try to hit some of the, uh, the, the high points. If you'd like to see me do a little bit deeper dive on all that, let me know in the comments. Uh, otherwise, we'll just kind of be moving on throughout the rest, and we may come to that if uh, there's enough interest out there. So we see uh, in verses one and two, uh, the beast rising up out of the sea. He's described with the ten horns, seven heads, ten diadems on the horns, and blasphemous names written on its seven heads. Uh, the beast was described as being like a leopard, uh, feet like a bear, mouth like a lion, and the dragon gives uh, his power and his throne and great authority to the beast. So again, here's kind of the snapshot of those descriptions. Ten horns with ten diadems on the horns, not necessarily resting on the, the heads, but on the horns itself. Horns, remember, represents power, authority, and strength. Uh, we have the seven heads with blasphemous names written on them, uh, described to be like a leopard, feet like a bear, mouth like a lion, and empowered by Satan. Now, where does it, all this imagery come from? And is there anything else biblically that we can reference that gives us an idea of what the beast is? And I'm glad you asked because yes, indeed, uh, Daniel chapter seven has a very similar kind of vision. Now, this is not to say that Revelation is copying off of this, it's saying that this is where we can understand because this is uh, a parallel to what we see in Revelation 13, but there's a new element that is revealed there in Revelation 13. So let's look at uh, Daniel chapter 7, uh, starting in verse 1. It says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts 
came up out of the sea, just like we see in Revelation 13, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one like a bear, it was raised up on one side and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had 10 horns. Uh, so this is a, a terrifying vision, uh, a, a dream in the night that Daniel has. And uh, he is puzzled by the meaning of the vision, uh, just as we may be. And I'm so glad that he was because he asked the question and the question is answered, what are the four beasts? Uh, so as, um, as he was praying about this, he gets an answer. So if you drop down to verse 15, it says, as for me, uh, Daniel, my spirit was uh, within me was anxious and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the thing. So here's one of the angelic beings uh, that Daniel uh, has encountered. And so he, he's asking now, what, what does all this mean? And here is the answer. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. So we're told very clearly that these are not sea monsters that are coming up, uh, that you would not literally be seeing uh, creatures, that you would be seeing people. You would see kings. Uh, and, and this is actually a parallel to Daniel chapter 2, most likely, where the king of Babylon had a dream of a great statue. And Daniel told him the dream and the interpretation of the dream, and that that was indeed for kingdoms. Now, this is why it's kind of led to the question of, are we talking about kingdoms or a king in this? But I think the, the two are really synonymous in the ancient Near East. The king is the kingdom. The kingdom belongs to the king. And so I think it does point to the fact that it's kings, but it does relate to a kingdom. You can't really separate the two. So you're kind of splitting hairs if you're looking at it that way. So in the question of, is the Antichrist a government uh, or is it a person? I think it really is both in the sense that it's the person, but also the government that it rules. So in the, the case of these two dreams, uh, we see that Daniel 2 in the chapter uh, the, uh, or in the, the statue that the, the king dreams about in Daniel chapter 7 is the four beasts uh, that Daniel dreams about. And they're really talking about the same thing. Uh, that the first part of the statue and the first beast are Babylon. Uh, then the second uh, part, the, the torso is um, uh, Medo-Persia. That's the bear. Uh, and then we have Greece. And then we have Rome uh, as the lower part of that. So this is that, that, that fourth beast that is so terrifying that um, Daniel really doesn't have a descriptive word. He just tells us that it's terrifying and very different from the others. So the beast... Uh, in Revelation 13, uh, is the amalgamation of all of them, uh, that it is all four in one. And this is the important aspect to be understood, that it's not four separate kings uh, or kingdoms, it is one. And this is a bigger uh, kingdom that is all-encompassing of all of these before, uh, and it will be much more powerful, much more influenced than what we have seen in the past. So the beast is generally understood to be the Antichrist, uh, in 1 John 2, 18, by the way, this is the only place that we find this term antichrist is in uh, 1 and 2 John, uh, and, but it, it is an accurate descriptor. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul calls him the man of lawlessness, and this is very much to be understood as the same uh, uh, creature here, the same person as uh, the antichrist. And this would be another reason to view this more as an individual rather than just simply a government entity. Um, and then the third is the, uh, the little horn of Daniel chapter seven and eight is also understood to be um, the, the antichrist. Um, now, first John tells us that there you know, been antichrist in the world, there will still be that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Uh, but I mentioned that in relation to the little horn because the little horn had a very clear uh, fulfillment 
in Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, this was one of the, uh, the Greek rulers. He was a very evil, wicked man. And uh, Daniel describes him very, very accurately. Uh, but I think he's also a type of the Antichrist. He is um, a prefiguring. That's what that word type means in uh, biblical terminology. Uh, that he's sort of the, the initial fulfillment, but there will be a worse uh, person to come along who is indeed the final fulfillment of that little horn in Daniel 7 and 8. So let's take a look at some key takeaways about the beast from the sea. So kind of summarizing some of the things that we see in those first 10 uh, verses. Number one, and I think this is important to, to understand, is that he will emerge from a chaotic time in human history. Uh, the sea in Hebrew thought uh, in ancient Near Eastern thought, uh, represented chaos. The world, remember in Genesis 1-2, was chaos. Um, it was tohu vabohu in Hebrew. It is formless, void. Uh, and, and so this is kind of what that, that we're seeing is a chaotic time. Isaiah also describes the world as being chaotic and describes it in the terms of a sea. And so this may be the imagery that's being pointed to here that as the the beast is rising up out of the, the sea, he's really emerging out of chaos. Now, um, I, I probably should have uh, recaptured the slide here, because if you go back and read Daniel 7, clearly what you're going to see is that um, as Daniel has the vision, uh, he sees the four beasts coming up out of the sea. But when the vision is interpreted, you see it talks about them coming from the land. So I don't think that we need to get too uh, caught up in sea versus land, uh, but I think that the sea imagery here is, is really uh, kind of pointing to chaos. Now, some of that chaos is going to uh, result from the seven seals and the trumpets. I mean, in the four horsemen alone, you have the white rider going out conquering, you have wars that are starting, uh, the second one, kind of the general violence increasing, the third one goes out, and you have uh, famine, you have hyperinflation, uh, and so you have economic disruption and shortages of food and other supplies. Uh, and then fourth uh, is death. So you have a, a decimation of 25% of the global population. I mean, if that were to happen today, we have an estimated population globally of about 8 billion people. And so that would be 2 billion deaths. Uh, that would create incredible chaos. Um, and so there, there would be, just from those, a lot of global chaos. Uh, but I think we also see that some of the chaos may be caused by, and, and I'll put collectively the beast, but the dragon behind that for sure. Uh, so economic chaos, um, uh, this whole Agenda 2030 that we hear talked about, that could be a tool uh, that is uh, used to bring about some chaos. War, uh, we certainly see a lot of chaos that comes out of that. And then uh, just as a fun one, and this is completely speculative, uh, you see a lot of this movement toward uh, affirming UFOs. Now, I'm a, I was a kid that grew up believing in UFOs and um, I, 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 I um, uh, you know, thought for sure that, that uh, extraterrestrials and aliens were out there. Uh, but theologically, I, I just don't see how that's a possibility from a biblical perspective. So I don't believe in that now, but I do see certainly a trend toward trying to, uh, to, to bring about this, even from the government, having tier, uh, hearings on this. And so here's uh, footage from one of the videos that was shown in a, in a ser uh, Senate hearing about the, um, uh, the so-called Tic Tac UFO. Uh, and, and so as far as uh, extraterrestrial life out there, I don't believe that, but I think that that could be one of those things that um, uh, whoever could use to create the illusion that we're under attack and that we need to come together in one world government to defend ourselves about this. This is the whole Star Trek premises uh, in a way. And I was a huge Trekkie uh, in my teens and 20s. Um, and, and it's that idea of the, the whole world coming together because of the realization of extraterrestrials being out there. And, and so we see this in a lot of other movies, predictive programming and so forth. So I don't know. Could that be a way? Possibly. Is that the way? I have no idea. Uh, and nobody really does. But I'm just saying that these are a lot of the different tools that are out there that are being used right now uh, to move people toward a particular agenda, to control population. And, and, and so we see this already happening in the world. Am I saying this is you know, the absolute end of you know, moving toward that and we're almost there? I really don't know. Uh, but I see that all of these are possible tools that the, uh, the Antichrist could use and that the, the Satan is using even now to move toward that one world government. Second big thing 
is that this antichrist person is going to appear godlike. Seven heads. Uh, this is uh, a seven is normally that divine number of completion. So head normally represents uh, wisdom. It represents authority. Uh, and then the 10 horns and 10 diadems would certainly represent strength and authority, complete control, complete authority. And so there, there seems to be this God likeness, this messianic likeness to him. Uh, and again, as we, we talked just briefly, 1 John 4, 3 tells us that the spirit of Antichrist is already at work in the world. Even when John was writing this in the first century, he said, this is the spirit of Antichrist and now is in the world already, which you heard was coming. Uh, so this Antichrist spirit has already been around since the first century, and it has emerged uh, in different manifestations uh, throughout time, uh, moving a little bit closer to that ultimate Antichrist, big A. Um, and we've seen some types, again, some prototypes of uh, Antichrist figures throughout history. Um, and uh, here is... Uh, a, a guy that has quite a bit of influence today. This is George Soros, um, and, and I'm not a fan. Uh, this guy is evil in many, many respects. Um, notice he wrote in a book this, and this is coming from an LA Times article back in 2004, but in, in a book he wrote, uh, he said, I fancied myself as some kind of God. Uh, if truth be known, I carried some rather potent messianic fantasies with me from childhood which I felt I had to control. Otherwise, they might get me in trouble. When asked by Britain's independent newspaper to elaborate on that passage, Soros said, it is sort of a disease when you consider yourself some kind of God, the creator of everything. But I feel comfortable about it now since I began to live it out. Wow. And so here's what you kind of see how George Soros envisions himself. And, and this is why he feels like he can do what he is doing in the world. Uh, most of the media in the U.S. is controlled by this man. Uh, and, and a lot of the things that I think are happening are, are funded, are directed uh, by his influence uh, in the world. And it's in part because of this God complex that he has. Now, is he the Antichrist? I, again, I don't know. Uh, but it will be someone like this who believes him to, himself to be um, godlike or God in the world, probably more the second that he believes himself to be a God in the world. And again, there have been many, many antichrist uh, in the world, but there's coming one final big A antichrist. Uh, so there've been a lot of the prototypes, a lot of that spirit of antichrist at work, a lot of these little beastly sort of creatures, uh, men, humans uh, throughout history. Uh, and there are Definitely an active little a antichrist in the world, but we're awaiting this one final beast to come. Uh, maybe here now, I don't know. You can let me know in the comments if you think, and, and if you think it's somebody in particular, I'd love to hear who you think it is and why, and you can just let me know in the comments. That would be interesting. But let's talk more importantly about what the beast will do. And again, I have no idea of the particular identity. I just know that there is one who is coming and he'll be known. Uh, it'll be pretty clear in that day. May not be in the initial stages. In fact, he'll be very deceptive. But let's talk more about what the beast will do. Number one, first descriptor, uh, he has the blasphemous names on his head. Uh, and that is a lot of what he does. He blasphemes God, God's dwelling, and God's people. So he will blaspheme Christians, without a doubt. Uh, he will um, deride, uh, he will... Uh, he will talk horribly about Christians. Christians will be uh, the, 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 the most hated group uh, during his reign. Um, and he demands worship as God. Second Thessalonians 2, 4, this is, uh, as we referenced earlier, the man of lawlessness, which is the same as the beast. Uh, it says that the man of lawlessness opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his uh, seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. Uh, so this is really the arrogance that we will see in the Antichrist. Doesn't mean that he'll have an evil face uh, or will be uh, evil looking, but he will do very evil things. And his key tactics are deception. We see that in Matthew 24, and we'll get that reference here in just a moment, and destructive heresies. This is sort of the, the key component of what tool the, the Antichrist will use. Uh, destructive heresies, they sound good, but man, they are 
destructive in the end. They are deadly. 1 John 2, 22, 4, 3, and 2 John 7 all reference uh, the Antichrist in connection with bad uh, theology. Theology is critically important. And the Antichrist will speak in theological terms, but it will be very destructive in what he says. Uh, so 1 John 2, 22 um, who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. Uh, 2 John uh, verse 7, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Uh, so anyone uh, who denies uh, the, the physical appearing of Christ, um, the, uh, his, his incarnation, and what he has done is an antichrist, according to John the Apostle, uh, anyone who denies the Father and the Son. So this would uh, include uh, groups like um, Islam uh, that deny that um, Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, they will tell you that you're cursed if you believe anything like that, according uh, to the Quran. But according to 1 John, it's just the opposite. So there may be some connection to, uh, you know, theologies like that that uh, wind up coming into play with this. Um, a second big thing is that we see that the Antichrist makes war on Christians. Uh, look at verse 7, the first part. Also it, the beast, the Antichrist, was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. These are very clearly followers of Jesus. So I intentionally use the word Christians because these are people who have placed their faith in Christ and follow him. These are ones who have been marked uh, by Christ. Um, third, it will rule the world under a single government. Uh, we see this in uh, the second part of uh, verse 7, and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. Now, uh, someone in a previous video had commented uh, that the rule of the Antichrist is really only in uh, the Middle Eastern world, uh, basically from the, the one extreme of the uh, Roman Empire uh, in Europe uh, to the advance of the Babylonian and Persian empires in the East, uh, since this is really the picture. I think that's where we're trying to hyper-literalize a little too much or, or being way too specific, uh, because I, th I think this is intended to say, no, it's really over every tribe, every nation, every language, it's global in the scope, according to Revelation 13. So while the descriptors are very similar to the four world empires, Babylon, Medo-Persian, Greek, and Roman, I don't think it's limited to those. I think the rule is global. That would include like the United States and all of those countries uh, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, as well as Australia and New Zealand and all that. Um, and, and this is kind of the heart of where we see uh, groups like the Bilderberg Group, World Economic Forum, um, and, and you, you've got a whole list of groups that are trying to move toward this right now. Um, and this is Klaus Schwab uh, and part of the whole Agenda 2030 movement of you will own nothing and be happy, um, that basically it will have total control of your life, um, that you will... Um, not have the, the pri private property, that you will be just a cog in the wheel of the, the government. The government will take care of you. Uh, it will assign you your, your work and so forth. Uh, very much a Marxist type um, totalitarian government uh, that we will see. Um, and, and this is, I think, one of those little a antichrist type statements uh, that is moving in that direction. Another one of those guys I'm not fond of by any means. So how does the world react to this? Um, and, you know, by and large, how does the world respond to the beast? This beast that arises out of the chaos, the beast that is promising peace and security and so forth, they love him and they worship him. And one of those little a antichrist, I think, is Hitler. A great example of trying to exert that global dominance, that global uh, government, uh, but remember, Germany voted him in. He did not take power by force. Uh, it, they uh, it, it, And here's a, a great picture here that kind of illustrates. After World War I, their sanctions were so strong against uh, Germany uh, at the end of the First World War, the Great War, uh, the war to, the, to end all wars, uh, left Germany in economic uh, ruin and chaos. 
uh, you find this woman here using German marks because they were so worthless to start a fire. Uh, stories told of a guy going to the grocery store uh, and he took a wheelbarrow load of cash to the store to buy his groceries. Um, and he left the wheelbarrow and the cash on the sidewalk, went in to buy his groceries. When it came time to pay, he went out to go uh, wheel in all the cash to pay for the groceries. And he found the cash dumped on the sidewalk and the wheelbarrow had been stolen. That was the only thing that had, that had any value. Germany was hurting financially, economically. Uh, and they're, they're, they, they were weak. They had, you know, Germany has always been kind of a, a, a great, strong uh, power in Europe for many, many centuries. And this was a hard thing to deal with. And so when Hitler comes along uh, talking about we will be economically stable again, uh, we will be a power again, you can lift your head high again. The people, I, I mean, if you've seen any videos of Hitler's speeches, they are cheering him on by the masses. They loved the Fuhrer. Uh, and, and, and they were essentially in, a, in kind of a, uh, a sense worshiping the, the Fuhrer. Uh, in the very real sense, the Antichrist will come on the scene uh, and people will love him because he's brought salvation. He's brought order from the chaos. Whenever there is chaos, people long for order and they will take even the worst of people. If they can bring about security and stability again, they will sacrifice freedoms. Uh, and we see this even now in order to have that sense of safety and security. And so uh, this Antichrist is not going to be a, a hated figure, feared perhaps because of his power, uh, but he will be loved and worshipped. The, 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 the world in general uh, will think he is the Messiah and will view him as such. Uh, and they will willingly believe the lies of the beast. Um, uh, chapter 13, verse 14 uh, speaks to this. And, and this is uh, really related to 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. It says the coming of the lawless, a lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they, the world who is perishing, refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And, and you may look at the world around you and wondering, how can people believe what they believe? And part of that is satanic deception. And part of it is God's judgment. That if you refuse to have it my way, fine. You will believe the lies of the enemy. And this is a sad state, but it will be much like in that day, much like the mindless zombies that just simply recite narrative without any basis in reality, and they will think themselves to be self-righteous and true in a level that we're not yet even seeing right now. So if what you see alarms you right now, it, it'll get worse. Um, and, 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 and certainly deception and fake news and so forth will be uh, all that we see around us. And that, that really brings us to the Christian's plight, because this is part of what we see in all this. And just a reminder, if any of this has been helpful so far, I hope you will like and subscribe. Uh, so the first thing that we see is that the, the beast will be given authority to conquer Christians. Uh, so this is a physical conquest to be able to bind them, imprison them, and to kill them. Um, and, and note, and, and this is important, there is no rapture before the beast arrival. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3 is abundantly clear. Um, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, this is talking about 1 Thessalonians 4, which is typically taken as the rapture passage. 2 Thessalonians is written only three to six months after 1 Thessalonians. And so he's talking about that same event in 1 Thessalonians 4. This is not a different event. Um, and so Paul goes on, he says about this rapture, as many people call it today, scripture calls it the gathering. He says, we ask you brothers not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or by a spoken word or by a letter to be uh, seeming to be from us uh, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way 
For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So again, this is referencing back to the coming of our Lord Jesus and our being gathered to him. So this is speaking of that rapturish kind of event. And he calls it that day. And that day, the coming of the Lord and our being gathered to him will not come unless the rebellion comes first uh, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. So there is a necessary event that precedes the coming of Jesus and the gathering of the saints. This is not a, uh, a, a an end, you know, the final return or whatever, how you might view that. There's, there isn't that distinction in scripture. And Paul is talking about one and the same event. So if First Thessalonians is talking about the rapture and many dispensationalists, many pre-trib um, uh, rapturists would believe that that is the passage that talks about it. You need to understand 2 Thessalonians 2 is talking about that one and the same event. It's not two different events. It's one and the same. And he says that day will not come unless the rebellion, the falling away uh, of many people who profess to be uh, Christians uh, and the world as a whole, that must come first and the Antichrist is revealed. Those are two important things that must happen before uh, the coming of Christ and the gathering of the saints. Third big thing that we see in this is that our fate is in the Lord's hand. Verses 9 and 10, he who has an ear, let him hear. Uh, if one is uh, to be, um, I think, in prison, you're going to prison, you will go. And if you're to die by the sword, you must die by the sword. Our fate is in the Lord's hand as believers. And however he seeks to glorify himself, that's his business. And, and we're simply his to bring him glory. And so a couple of questions just to ask here. Have you surrendered fully to God's sovereignty over your life and your death? Uh, is, is he truly Lord of your life? Does he have the right to take you at any moment in any way that, that he sees fit? And the answer ought to be yes. And second is, this is a call to endure, not to despair. Uh, chapter 13, verse 10 is probably the key verse in the entire book of Revelation. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. This is the ongoing theme throughout the entire book. It's a call to endure, to stand firm for Christ, to not compromise our faith, no matter the pressure that comes against us, even if it involves our death. So that's the first beast. Let's talk about the second. Uh, this is the overlooked beast, and, and he is uh, incredibly important. And sometimes the things get conflated between the first and the second beast. So let's take a, a look at this to make sure we get some clarity between the two and what their role is. So starting in verse 11, here's the description of the second beast. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. And it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. And so the second beast appears um, Messiah-like. It, it appears Jesus-like, the two horns like a lamb, but it speaks like Satan. Uh, so this is what we hear in Jesus's warning in Matthew 24, to watch out for false Christ that will come, false messiahs uh, that will be coming. Uh, and, and so this ultimate second beast is kind of that ultimate false messiah. And he seems to be in charge of creating that, that false uh, religion. Now notice uh, that he has great authority, just like the first beast. So there's a tie in between the two with that. Uh, but he's also able to perform deceptive, miraculous signs. And, and we're not talking sleight of hand. Uh, these will probably be genuine, supernatural acts. So not the snake oil salesman uh, or the charlatan or the magician who's able to, you know, just simply make the illusion 
I think these will be genuine supernatural acts uh, that the second beast is able to perform. Uh, Matthew 24 uh, cautions us, false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So a word of caution, just because something is done in a church uh, by a person who calls themselves a pastor or a prophet or an apostle or something like that, does not mean it's legitimate. Um, and, and, and this is something we need to be careful because not every miracle is from God. This is Benny Hinn, um, his trademark slinging the coat and people being slain in the spirit and so forth. False prophets can perform false signs, and it's not just gimmicky. Uh, there, there will be uh, miraculous healings, even uh, doing something like Elijah did. I think this is a reference there that the beast is able to call down fire from heaven in front of people. And I don't think it's illusory. I think this is a legitimate uh, kind of action. It is just not legitimately from God. It is satanically empowered and it is intended to deceive. Um, he forces the world to worship the beast and make a demonically empowered idol. Um, so uh, the, the main role of the second beast is to create that one world religion. Uh, and, and this is that religion that is beast focused. And, and this is not new. I mean, even as recent as uh, the second world war, uh, the Japanese emperor was considered to be a God and people gave him def uh, deference in that way. Um, the Caesars in Rome were considered to be gods. And this is why many Christians in the first century were killed because the requirement, although Rome was religiously tolerant. You could practice your religion. Everyone was required to give that token bit of worship to Caesar. And it was a, simply a pinch of incense on an altar. And because the believers could not do that, they were dragged into the arenas and fed to the lions and gladiators. And so uh, what we see this second beast doing is pointing people kind of like the, the Messiah saying, man, this is the guy. And, 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 and kind of fulfilling that prophetic role and moving people to this one world religion of a worship of the beast. Uh, but the, the beast, the second beast, is also able to create this idol that is able to speak. And this is also going to be a convincing sort of part of this. Uh, and the idol seems to be is the one who is able to even summon uh, or sentence people uh, to death, the Christians who don't give that, that due diligence. Uh, and we're told in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 20 and Deuteronomy 13, 6, uh, 16, uh, that behind the idols is really the demonic power. So while people might say uh, this is a God and so forth. So if you ever go to um, India and you see all the, the Hindu gods out there, there's, and, you know, there may be some kind of activity around this. Missionaries uh, have told me stories of things that have happened, but we understand that that is demonically empowered. And this will certainly be the case. And, and notice that it's the second beast that causes people to get the mark of the beast. Uh, look at verse 17. It's the second beast that is forcing people to give the mark. So it's the one world religion, the second beast, that's going to be the promoter of the mark, not the first beast, not the one world government per se. The, the two are intimately tied together, but the impetus for getting the mark will be religious. Interesting. And so that kind of brings us now to the, the next main part is the mark of the beast. Uh, what is it and what does it mean? So let's look at verses 16 through 18. This is where we understand what this is. Also it, second beast, causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast, or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understand calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So again, Christ marked his people in Revelation 7, the seal. The false Christ will also mark his people. And that's part of the distinction that we see. Now, people without the mark, will suffer temporarily. No one can buy or sell uh, unless he has the mark. And this may also be a death sentence, because remember, uh, the, the image and the second beast are able to sentence people to death, and it may be related to not having 
uh, the mark of the beast. But certainly there is economic impact. You can't work. You can't earn money. Uh, you can't spend money. Um, and this, I don't know, could be the part of one of the ways that they do that is the, the digital currency that's being talked about, where if you don't have the right social credit score, uh, then your money is frozen. It's gone. Um, and, and we're certainly rapidly moving in that direction. This is where the governments, interestingly, uh, want to take us uh, for our own good. Uh, but this is part of how that something like that could be used in a day like this. Uh, second, uh, people with the mark, here's kind of the spoiler alert for chapter 14, will suffer eternally. So while you as the believer may uh, refuse the mark and suffer for that, it's only temporary. Um, they can kill you, but they can't harm you. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they can kill your physical body, but they can't harm you as who you are. Uh, but for those who take the mark of the beast, they will suffer eternally. Uh, chapter 14, verse 9 says, and another angel, the third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. There, there's just no relief. Verse 11 and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Just real quickly, and we won't get into this a whole lot, because later on we'll do another episode on hell. Revelation is pretty clear. Hell is real, hell is painful, and hell is eternal, and the suffering is eternal. Notice it's not just the smoke of their torment that goes up forever. It is them, day and night, no rest. The sufferers are lasting forever. That's another discussion. So you can argue with me now, but I won't really get to that until the, that episode that we do that. But just notice, if you ever had any kind of inkling in your heart and mind just to hedge your bets and be safe and get the mark um, and give that allegiance to the beast so that you don't have to go through that, you might escape the temporary pain, but the eternal pain will be there. You will endure the wrath of God. Better to endure the wrath of the beast than to endure the wrath of the lamb. Just saying. Second big thing, the mark is a sign of allegiance to the beast and ownership by the beast. This is important. Hang on to this. This is showing you belong to the beast. You give your allegiance, you give your devotion to the beast. This is a choosing sides moment. You're either going to be on the side of God, the side of Christ, or you're going to be on the side of the beast. And this is where you're, if you have not already, you're making that choice. By the way, if you're not sealed by the lamb today, you by default belong to Satan. Um, you're not by default on your way to heaven. Uh, John 3, 36 and 37 is very, very clear that if anyone is not in Christ, if we have not been born again by the spirit of the living God, uh, we are under God's wrath already. We need to be rescued from the domain of darkness and transfer the kingdom of his beloved son. Second thing, there are only two kingdoms that are mentioned in heaven, the kingdom of light, which is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, uh, or the kingdom of darkness, domain of darkness, uh, which is Satan's realm. And by default, because of our sin, uh, because of our willful disobedience and rebellion against God, we, by default, belong to the domain of darkness. We need to be rescued from that. So taking the mark is not the movement into the king of domain of darkness. It's affirming you already belong there and your heart is now loyal to that. Uh, so Revelation 13, um, 17 uh, and 18, uh, what is the mark? Um, notice the highlighted parts, the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of the name. And then notice again, for it is the number of a man and his number is 666. So ignore the 666 part. This is the part that people get caught up on a lot. And it may not necessarily be literally the number 666 that is impressed upon uh, the hand, right hand or the forehead. Um, what it is representing is the name of the beast. And, and so the number could be that, that representation. So yes, that is a possibility. And, and I'm not denying that by any means, 
But more importantly, it is that representation of the name of the beast, whoever that is at that point. So in whatever way that that takes, um, uh, takes its form, that's what this is representing. It is showing the allegiance to the beast. And so it represents the name of the beast. You're taking uh, his name on you. You're showing that you are loyal uh, and devoted to the beast by taking the mark. So in whatever way that that takes effect uh, or whatever form that takes, it is related to the name. So it could be words. It could be the name that you're being tattooed or somehow imprinted uh, with that. Uh, uh, but it is uh, could also be represented numerically. Um, and that number may not necessarily be literal numbers, but in marks, as we'll see. Um, and, and this has always been that point of uh, speculation by a lot of people. What is the mark? Uh, and, and so I remember as a kid, the original UPC symbols, um, they, they had this very clear mark on the outside and in the middle. And if you'll notice, uh, you can see the mark on the, whoops, let me go back. Uh, the mark on the far left side is two narrow bars. The mark on the far right side is two narrow bars and the mark in the, uh, the middle, which all the old UPC symbols had that, uh, was the two narrow bars. Notice here that next to last mark, that's the number six. That's the way that a six would be represented on a UPC barcode. And so when people realize this, they're like, wait, the UPC symbol is the, the mark of the beast. And so we'll be tattooed with a UPC symbol. And that's how, you know, they'll, they'll get it. They'll, they'll scan us. And this was even before we really had the scanning technology at that point. Um, my dad had a grocery store and we had to label things by hand. It had the UPC barcode on there. Even when cash registers did not have the technology uh, to scan that, which is fascinating to me. They knew that that might one day come but it wasn't yet available in most grocery stores. And so later in like the late 80s, early 90s, when scanning technology uh, came along and became popularized, we didn't have to mark the cans anymore. They could just scan the barcode. And so uh, even before grocery stores had scanners, people were talking about it'll be something like that that can somehow be read electronically. So there was some insight with that. Uh, but now UPC uh, symbols have changed dramatically. They're very different. So they don't look like this anymore. The new UPC is very different. Um, and, and so people have speculated a lot about what it is. Is it an implant? Is it a chip? Is it you know this or that? Um, here's the key thing. I want you to remember that whatever the mark is, it is related to allegiance to the beast. And this is important. Because I don't think that we need to fear an immunization. Now, not for the sake of a mark, <laughs> you know, because and I say this because during COVID, uh, there were a lot of people who were saying uh, they're just injecting us with the mark of the beast. Uh, that if you get the COVID shot, there's the little RFID chip or there's some kind of um, uh, device in there that will be the mark. And if you take the COVID shot, um, then, uh, th then you're sunk. You're, you're on your way to hell uh, because you took the shot. I don't think that they'll be able to give you the mark without your consent because it is about allegiance. It is about identifying with the beast. That's why I don't think you need to fear shots for the sake of the beast. There are many, many other good reasons to fear immunizations and shots and so forth, uh, but that's not it. There, there, there are reasons why you might not take a shot, but because you might get accidentally or, um, or, or deceitfully the, the mark that way, I don't think that that is the case because it is about the heart condition of declaring allegiance to the beast, that I am making a conscious decision to do this. Now, I think that it'll probably be uh, introduced with carrots, and this is speculation, uh, that there'll be enticements to do this at first. Um, you know, there'll be all the positive things to do that. But I think it will be enforced with the sticks. And this is what Revelation 13 bears out. You won't be able to buy or sell. Uh, you won't be able to buy food uh, without the mark. You won't be able to work with, without the mark. And so interestingly, it's flip-flop of Nazi Germany where those who had this particular mark weren't able to do those things. But it'll be those who uh, don't have this kind of distinguishing mark uh, that will be the ones uh, who will be tormented. So it'll be the absence of the mark that leads to the inability to work, make money, um, buy things, and maybe even be put to death. 
So the, the mark does seem to be a numerical representation of the name of the beast. Um, and so this is where that numerology uh, might, might come in, where each letter uh, represents a number, A is one, B is two, and so forth. Uh, my question is, which language do we use at that point and, you know, which alphabet? And so, you know, that's one of the, it's a biblical mystery. And this is why we have that call for wisdom. Um, this is not something that may be immediately obvious, but it is encoded uh, in scripture in order to alert us that this is coming and it will be recognizable when the day comes. Uh, so it may not be a predictive thing where you can say, oh, it'll be this person or they'll have this name, uh, but you, it'll be recognizable when it comes. And so it'll, the understanding, I think, will be fully unlocked at that moment, uh, maybe not beforehand. We can speculate a lot until then, uh, but we may not have the full understanding until that more, uh, moment. Um, six, though, is that important number. It's the number of man. He is 666, uh, not 616. That is uh, not accurate. 666 is the number. And that is like ultimately falling short of the divine. Seven is the perfect divine number. Uh, he tries to portray himself as being divine, the seven heads, but he's merely a man. And he falls short in every way, even though he has a satanically empow uh, empowerment and authority, he is still just a man. And I think that's part of what uh, the, the, the number is trying to represent. He is not the Messiah. He is not the God man. He is not God incarnate like Jesus. He's falling short of that in every way. Uh, by the way, uh, pride flag has only six colors, not seven. If you've never stopped to count, uh, God's rainbow has seven. Uh, man's has six. And, you know, this, if you're thinking about that numerically as a representation and certainly where uh, the world is going, social credit score and so forth, could it be some derivation of this as the mark? I don't know. That's speculation. Uh, but it kind of fits within the realm of uh, where things are going, because certainly this agenda is being pushed in order to confuse what love truly is. Um, biblical love is very different from what the world is pushing on us. And because of this, Godly love is being seen as being hateful. There are bumper stickers out there that says there's no, no hate quite like Christian love. Um, this is certainly being used to indoctrinate children in a future generation and this generation that we live in to make Christianity look reprehensible. And so that's part of that setup, I think, um, of making Christians the despised group of people like the Jews were in Nazi Germany, um, in the, the last days, seeing Christians in this light where the world just absolutely hates you because you belong to Christ, this is, I think, part of that setup. So here's just some quick applications here. Number one, be on guard. Uh, spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. Um, lies and deception and destructive heresies are the primary tools of Antichrist. We see this already in big ways infiltrating the church in the West. Uh, prosperity gospel, um, and you have Kenneth Copeland on the top. Uh, as one of those examples, absolutely clearly a false teacher leading many people on the destructive path to hell. Uh, what he teaches is not the true gospel of the Bible, but millions and millions are given to him and thousands upon thousands follow and eat on his every word. Um, and the second is uh, progressive Christianity. Um, and we see this influencing in uh, crazy ways um, and taking over uh, many churches and denominations, and um, it, you, you don't have to do a long search in YouTube or Facebook reels to see um, just the reprehensible things that are said uh, by people that God is trans, God is gay, God is non-binary, blah, 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 and uh, the, changing the creeds that they say, uh, the prayers that they say, um, just absolutely revolting, disgusting. And uh, so may God deal with them, uh, and he will. Uh, but it's not just limited to lies and so forth. John 8, 44 tells us, I love the way NIV puts it, that whenever Satan lies, he speaks his own native language. And whenever you hear lies being used in politics uh, and other arenas, that's just the spirit of Antichrist at work. Second, be ready. Revelation is not preparing us for escape and exceptionalism. It is preparing us for endurance and engagement. Again, Revelation 13, 10. Uh, and by the way, if you want to see another video on uh, that, a little bit deeper dive, why I land where I do, um, look at the one, um, and I'll, I'll leave the link here on Revelation chapter four, is the rapture in Revelation four. I do a little bit deeper dive on that, um, but that's important. And notice Matthew 5, 11 and 12 related to this. 
Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you uh, falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. So, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you look and smell enough like Jesus that the world hates you, you're not despised by God. You're favored by God and you are blessed by God. And so those who will be persecuted and even killed during that time are not um, God's stepchildren. <laughs> um, they are God's favored people. And, uh, and, and so may God give us all that grace and strength um, to look and smell like him so much that the world around us uh, does persecute us. Not that I'm seeking persecution. I don't have a martyr complex. I don't like discomfort, uh, but I love Jesus and I want to be like him. Um, third, I don't know why I have a be there. Be joyful. <laughs> uh, you're blessed if you look and smell a lot like Jesus that the world wants to persecute you. Um, and we just talked about that. So I jumped ahead of myself. <laughs> so if you've got any questions or comments, if you disagree with me, you can let me know. My feelings won't be hurt. I'm a big boy. Um, and um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And certainly if you've got other insights, love to hear those as well. And certainly if you got anything at all out of this, hope you'll like the video. That lets YouTube know that there's something of value and other people might um, benefit from this as well. Uh, and be sure to like and share uh, and subscribe. Um, we've got about 20 other videos in this series and love for you to follow all along and uh, look forward to seeing how we can grow together in the word. Thanks for watching. And until we meet again, um, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus and may the Lord indeed hasten that day. God bless. We'll see you next time as we talk about Revelation chapter 14.